Our next presenter is Roger Moore. Roger Moore is a second year PhD student in Oklahoma State University's History Department. He has published two books focusing on collegiate wrestling for the National Wrestling Hall of Fame and Museum, one in 2009 and one in 2010. Moore served as the director of the Sherrar Museum of Stillwater History in 2017 and as sports editor for the Stillwater News Press from 1999 to 2009. Today, he is presenting his work on Japanese wrestlers in a 1960s Oklahoma college town. Thank you. Don't be as polished as the last uh, performer. He's a professionalist. I'm a journalist, a 25-year journalist uh, up in Stillwater, so uh, bear with me. You talk, like I said, doctoral candidate, a student at OSU. Um, many of you may or not know, the state of Oklahoma has a very rich history in sports, especially in wrestling. Not the professional kind, but the collegiate kind at Oklahoma State, which has won 34 NCAA championships. From 1928, the first year the NCAA held a tournament until 1960, Oklahoma Agricultural and Mechanical College, which is now OSU, won 19 of the 32 NCAA meets contested. OSU claimed five more team titles, thanks in part to an influx of Japanese wrestlers in the 1960s. Most wrestling aficionados know this story as told by Oklahoma sports journalists over the last century. My goal moving forward is to bring these useful stories into academic environments. My focus in research is in sports history, specifically wrestling and where it fits into the, o the American cultural and social narrative. I also explore the role sport can play in creating positive outcomes through cultural exchanges. The sports venue as a place where race, class, gender, and politics can be put aside. This is not always an easy idea considering the global impact of sports over the last five decades. Remembering that these are just games, a leisure activity is often lost on those who put too much value on outcomes rather than participation. Sports history as a field has only been around since about the 1970s. So despite its prominent place in American culture of the last century, scholarly research is still somewhat in an adolescent stage. A perfect example of the multiple themes available for research in sports history can be found in Stillwater. It was here that a group of Japanese wrestlers found athletic success and negotiated a generational divide. You have to remember the first half of the 20th century. It's, first, it's, two, it's, it's two world wars and racial tensions that were the backdrop of these 18 to 20 year old young men who came to a small college town in the Midwest from their native Japan. They were not part of the multiple generations of Japanese who immigrated to the United States in the early 20th century. Unlike those who settled in tight-knit and small segregated communities in the West Coast, they came alone. 1,500 miles to the east, from 1960 to 1972, six Japanese wrestlers combined to win six individual NCAA titles while adapting to a community that did not have the same cultural ties to, the Jap to Japan that had developed on the West Coast. But before we can talk about wrestling, we must talk about the racism in the United States against Asi people of Asian descent. The Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 was the first US federal law to prohibit immigration of a specific nationality. The Philippine-American War at the end of the 19th century portrayed Southeast Asians, Filipinos, as less than human within the propaganda and imperialism of war. The Immigration Act of 1924 suspended all Asian immigration. Then, in February of 1942, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor by Japan, Executive Order 9066 authorized the building of 10 relocation camps. More than 110,000 West Coast Japanese were placed in these camps for the remainder of World War II. Federal policy and legislation in no way provides a complete story or describes the difficult existence of many of Asian descent in American communities. Newspaper and media helped create stereotypical group identities through the 1940s. It is very important to recognize that within this complicated narr narrative also exists the 442nd Combat Team, an infantry unit of second generation Japanese Americans, one of the most decorated American military units during World War II. Also, the 100th Battalion, a, second, a segregated infantry unit that consisted of second generation Japanese Americans, fought in the brutal Italian campaigns of the war. Despite these clear acts of patriotism, Japanese Americans, like the others labeled by white society, were continually forced to prove their commitment to the American ideal. One of the places they did this was through athletics. Into this dynamic steps Ichiro Hata and Myron Roderick. 
Ichiro Hata, a native of Hiroshima, visited the United States in 1929 promoting judo, doing exhibitions and competing against collegiate wrestlers during this tour. Hata was a pupil of Kano Jigoro, the founder of judo in Japan, who two decades earlier spent time in the U.S. working with President Theodore Roosevelt. Some might argue that judo and wrestling, through their workouts during the diplomatic talks, had a direct influence on, the Rose on Roosevelt's ability to negotiate peace for the Russo-Japanese War in 1905. Some in Japan, a couple decades later, like Ichiro Hata, felt incorporating some wrestling technique into judo would strengthen Japanese Olympic prowess when and if judo was included in the Olympic program. Judo had no wrestling, or excuse me, Japan had no wrestling association or federation nor organized wrestling of any kind outside the traditional sumo, which has a much larger significance than sport in J Japanese culture. So in 1929, Ichiro Hata found, founded the, D, the Dai Nippon Amateur Wrestling Association, which would later become the Japanese Wrestling Federation. In 1932, while Japanese swimmers were winning medals at the Summer Olympics in Los Angeles, Japanese wrestlers, including Hata, did not fare so well because wrestling was still in its infant stage in their country. Four years later, Hata coached the Japanese wrestling team at the 1936 Olympics in Berlin. He also fought in World War II in China. In 1956, he would become forever linked with Oklahoma State Wrestling. At the 1956 Summer Games in Melbourne, in Melbourne, Australia, Mitsu Okeda and Shozo Sashihara became the first Japanese wrestlers to win gold medals in freestyle. Sashihara beat American Myron Roderick on his way to the 126 pound championship. Roderick, a native of Kansas, the son of a teacher and principal, became a three time NCAA champion at OSU and was set to succeed Art Griffith in 1957 as the next head wrestling coach at OSU. Roderick was 21 years old at the time when he was asked by Director of Athletics Henry Iba if he would take over for the retiring Griffith and lead the nation's preeminent program when he, learned, when he returned from Melbourne. Sometimes we perhaps, we perhaps put too much focus on individuals in building historical narratives. Was Roderick in the right place at the right time, or was he a product of historical events already taking shape? Ichiro Hara at the time also was weighing the options of sending his son, Masaki, to the U.S. to go to college. Among the people Hata confided in was Tolson Tom Lumley, an Olympic official who wrestled for Gallagher at OSU and who also understood that California had a, was a place with small pockets of Japanese communities and culture. Or would it be Stillwater, where Roderick was in charge of the nation's top program? The young Roderick understood that collegiate recruiting was expanding beyond the regional dynamic and the, that the playing fields were desegregating in the late 1950s. In 1960, the choice would be OSU for Masaki Hata. Masaki Hata, however, was not the first Japanese wrestler to compete collegially in the U.S. Fortun Masdeo of San Jose State qualified for the NCAA championships in 1940. And from 1958 to 1978, at least one wrestler with Japanese descent qualified for the NCAA meet. West Coast representation of these wrestlers shows a direct link to many first-generation Japanese families who first settled in the West in the early 20th century. The Los Angeles Times continually reported on the vocal presence of Japanese fans throughout the 1932 Olympics in Los Angeles. Japanese communities raised money and also hosted visiting Japanese athletes during these depressed economic times in the early 1930s. The swimming pool became a festive link between California's Japanese population and those of their native country. Considering the rising global nationalism of the 1930s, this is, again, yet another example of the hot and cold, complicated relationship between Americans and Asians during the 20th century. That same cultural support seen in Los Angeles would not be available to those who attended Oklahoma State 1,300 miles to the east three decades later. Without scholarship limitations, Roderick employed a system that would allow for large and diverse rosters. After the almost stoic and mythic stature of the program's first two coaches, Edward Gallagher and Art Griffith, the young Roderick was energetic, he was loud, and he was very aggressive. He began recruiting outside the program's traditional Oklahoma talent. It was a matter of necessity. Oklahoma's population and limited high school programs made in order to remain at the top of the wrestling ladder, a wider recruiting base was required. Required, excuse me. Following the difficult 1957 season, his first, OSU finished fourth, which is a bad season for OSU wrestling, for those of you who know. Um, Roderick quickly returned the program back to the top rung. 
Here you see a list of the six Japanese wrestlers that attended OSU from 1960 to 1972. What you will notice in this 1965 team photo is a very diverse group of athletes. Yojiro Yutaki, with the gold medal that's in the middle there with the team surrounding him, is considered one of the greats of American collegiate wrestling. He was undefeated in three years and also won gold medals for his native Japan in 64 and 1968. He retired to Japan following the 1968 Games of Mexico City, but remains in contact with the program to this day. Also in the picture is Bobby Douglas, one of three black men to represent the United States in wrestling at the 1964 Olympics. It marked the first time an African-American made a U.S. Olympic team in wrestling. Douglas would finish fourth at the 64 Games in Tokyo, thanks in part to Ichiro Hata's efforts the previous three decades in getting Japanese to host the Games. The 1940 Games were supposed to be there as well, but they were canceled due to World War II. Also in 1964, Joe James became the first black man to win an NCAA wrestling title for Oklahoma State. And as recruiting, as recruiting, as, and as recruiting will do, it was Yutaki who actually recruited Yoshiro Fujita to Stillwater. In making the 1968 Japanese Olympic team, Yutaki beat the rising high school star Fujita and convinced him to come to Stillwater as well. So it is evident that Roderick had a plan and understood the changing landscape of integrated college athletics. Also in the photo is Tadaki Hata, Ichiro Hata's second son to attend OSU. Tadaki has provided valuable stories, memories, and explanations in helping me with my research. He remains in the U.S. living in Ohio. Another valuable resource has been Henri Huhara, whose family lived in Stillwater during the 1960s. Both through oral history interviews and digging through their photographic scrapbooks are invaluable and usable links to the period we are discussing. The language of sport does not require translation often. The late 19th century saw the beginnings of a codification of rules with the aid of the Olympic movement. This meant that inside the sports venue everyone was playing by the same rules. But college athletes in the United States, especially those from foreign countries, must deal with things outside the playing field, court, or mat. Once the games are complete, they must live in different communities, adjust their dietary habits, work through language barriers, the basics of everyday life that many American college student athletes might take for granted. Throw in the turbulent dynamic, the racial dynamic of the 1960s, and sports teammates quickly become family. So, let's imagine, a 20-year-old who doesn't speak the language must completely change his diet and adjust to American ways of college life. Add to that a climate of a parent of a teammate asking, how could you possibly associate with anyone from Japan? You know your uncle was a United States Marine who fought on Iwo Jima. Or another parent saying, we don't want you hanging out with anyone from Asia since your father was a Korean War veteran. Dealing with a desegregated society in name only might have been easier closer to the West Coast pockets of Japanese culture. But in Stillwater, ties to home and a safe and familiar zone were limited. The Stillwater Telephone Directory for 1960, for instance, lists just three residents with any Asian surname and no businesses of any kind. Tadaki Hata remembers that when he was in Stillwater, there was a very limited Japanese presence. We just had to adapt, he said. Henri Uhara remembers a handful of gatherings where his family tried to give these Japanese wrestlers any kind of a taste of home by just hanging out and inviting them over. I knew I was different, he said, but I was young enough not to experience some of the things my sister did and the wrestlers did. One of the things he remembers is the difficulty of his mother trying to find just basic ingredients to cook anything Japanese cuisine. But like many in unfamiliar surroundings, he and his family adjusted as he grew up, finding ways to negotiate the available environment. Within this context, between fathers and mothers, attempting to keep traditional cultural ties intact is a rising group of young people attempting to either assimilate, adjust, or create new safe spaces for their evolving futures. A common theme throughout is the relationship to sport and education, and the sports venue as a catalyst to more significant ends. Tadaki Hata could not speak English upon his arrival in Stillwater. He earned acceptance through his athletic and wrestling prowess, earning a degree in fine arts at OSU and a master's in painting from Northwestern University in 1968. He is an artist, author, and coach. He met his wife, Susan, while in Stillwater. They were married in 1967. His three children attended prominent American universities, including his son, Ben, who wrestled for the Ivy Leagues University of Pennsylvania. Tadaki Hata has been a prominent figure in the rise of the U.S. women's freestyle program, coaching the U.S. women at the 2008 Beijing Olympics, and has remained involved well into his 70s, coaching at the 2020 games, 2021 games in Tokyo as well. 
He was also part of the Japanese coaching staff in Mexico City in 68 and coached the Mexican team at the 72 games in Munich. His brother, Masaki, was inducted in the National Wrestling Hall of Fame in 2007 for his influential coaching in Michigan. The brothers learned from watching their coach, Myron Roderick, who was not omniscient but understood the competitive nature of American sports and its long-term value. Along with being a coach, Roderick was also a businessman. His company supplied the wrestling mats for the 1964 Summer Games in Tokyo, yet another example of this complicated relationship between the U.S. and Japan in the decades following World War II. The Hottest took some of these useful lessons in the mid-1960s to negotiate and build successful lives in the U.S. Henri Uhara, whose family provided that small taste of home for these Japanese athletes, attended college at Yale. So, why was Yoshiro Fujita the last Japanese wrestler for OSU in 1972? The reasons are many. Number one, Title IX and scholarship limitations took shape in the early 70s. This meant that these rosters just couldn't have unlimited people. The scholarships were limited, so wrestling has 9.9 .9 scholarships now, so obviously the recruiting base wasn't as global and as widespread as it could have been. Also, the continued revisions of the TOEFL test to evaluate English-speaking ability in the early 1970s. That continues to be revised, but they had to actually speak some English starting in the early 70s as well. It wasn't just kind of a free-for-all. Uh, number three, the retirement of Roderick himself in 1970 um, to go into business. One of his projects was the development of the National Wrestling Hall of Fame in 1975 in Stillwater. So he left, so that link to Japan kind of ended too. And perhaps the most significant, most significant thing, in my opinion, is the importance of Olympic wrestling rules versus American collegiate folk style rules. Why would Japanese wrestlers train for three or four years in a discipline that is not the Olympic style? Many of the folk style rules still in use today could be attributed to Gallagher and Griffith, the two coaches who preceded Roderick. So why does any of this matter? What does it all mean? Historians' use of sports narratives regarding race and ethnicity uses Native Americans like of Oklahoma's own Jim Thorpe, African Americans like baseball's Jackie Robinson, boxing's Muhammad Ali, football's Jim Brown, basketball's Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Since the early 1970s in Title IX, gender studies in sports history have proliferated, proliferated, say that three times fast. And of course, the Olympic Games provide useful themes to explore the role of sports in the United States, some positive and some negative. The role of race and ethnicity is a dominant theme in American history. As my program has shown, in some ways, maybe we can learn some things from a group of Japanese wrestlers and their experiences in an Oklahoma college town. The sports venue, like a wrestling mat, can provide a place to set aside race, politics, and gender. Ichiro Hata and Myron Roderick, neither perfect and products of different eras, should be given credit for playing a role in mending some of these divides, a role of sports, in my opinion, should continue to fulfill. And that's it. Thank you. Questions or any? Yeah, I, I wrestled in high school, and uh, there's always uh, names and techniques for takedowns and throws and reversals and all kinds of stuff. Was there any technique that the Japanese or at OSU, any signature uh, takedown, reversal? Is there anything that they? Well, one, well the, what, one of the weird things about this period, too, is that Roderick, as, as OSU was dominating the sport, the use of the takedown, just the basic double leg takedown, and this the technique of take them down, let them up, like John Smith does today. The NCAA and the, and the other coaches changed the rules. They only wanted to give you two for your first takedown, and then one for every subsequent because they wanted to hurt OSU because they lived off the takedown. So the rules were they attempted to change it. So um, OSU's always I mean, it, Gallagher started with with mat wrestling is where it started. Griffith was the one that incorporated, let's on our feet, let's do more takedowns as, as the rules evolved. And, and then Roderick was really a, a takedown. He was what John really built off of is just the, the basic attack, leg, leg attacks, double leg, single leg, the basic you know, stuff that's still fundamental and still used today, pretty much. No, it ended in 72 was the last one. Um, the last actual NCAA champion from Japan was in 98, Sinshiro Abe for Penn State. There's been a handful here and there, but just it, because like I said, folk style is only an American style. 
the rest of the world wrestles freestyle in Greco-Roman. So again, why would you take four years to train in a style that's not going to help you win Olympic gold? And somehow the Americans still find ways to win gold medals because of just the culture of wrestling. But that's the debate that is, goes on for wrestling purists. For, it's going on for the next 1,000 years. Like, why are we wrestling a different style than the Olympic style? So that's why you don't see a lot of international wrestlers actually in the U.S. because of that. So it's an, it's an American style, and it's just been that way forever. There's always a, a small influx here and there, but it's just... It's, it's, it's almost like if you want to win Olympic gold, you know, it, it, has, it, it can work as a mix of judo and wrestling itself. It's kind of a, it's a mixed martial art, so they all help each other. But, you know, the, there's, not a, there's a lot more mat wrestling than there is in, in college than there is in, in international. He had, he had people around him that, that helped for sure. He was Like I said, I think it's more of a, a product of the time because uh, Shiro Hada was looking to send his son. At first, he's going to go to one of these California schools because it's like there, you have a more, more culture and more places to, to hang out. But um, Roderick kind of convinced him that if you want to come wrestle in the U.S., and that was the first program anywhere east of the Rockies, obviously, that, that had. And it's like, do you want to come here and win? I mean, do you want the discipline of this program or you want to go out there where it's not as serious out there? Wrestling has always been – it's – it's serious, but not, and Stillwater is a different thing. You, you, you know what I'm talking about. So it was a, a question of do you want to go to college in the U.S. in California, or do you want to go wrestle in Stillwater for Myron Roderick? So Roderick had a lot of people around him that helped him get the stuff going. Thank you. Let's get on track here. Appreciate it. Thank you.